Hello and welcome to Start Select, the video game show brought to you from the green screen wall dungeon of GameSpot UK. I'm Guy Cocker. And I'm Jane Douglas. And coming up on this week's show... Uh, we look over the biggest news, including the UK charts, a release date for World of Warcraft's Cataclysm, and EA taking the Taliban out of Medal of Honor. Uh, we meet the man, the legend, the double fine Mr. Tim Schafer. We grill the development team behind Deus Ex Human Revolution. And Mark and I continue the building of our epic, winnable gaming PC. Uh, also coming up, we run down the week's new releases and giveaway copies of Castlevania Lords of Shadow on the Xbox 360. Time to jump into this week's news now. The first story we've pulled out is another chart story. Uh, FIFA 11 shooting and scoring its way to number one. Now, it's the third biggest UK launch ever behind Modern Warfare 2 and Grand Theft Auto 4. It accounted for nearly two out of every three Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games sold last week, and one for the Xbox 360 fanboys. Um, it sold more copies on the 360 than it did on the PlayStation 3. So, uh, Jane, FIFA, no, probably not your area of expertise, but this is a huge launch. It's, it's kind a football of, game. It's a football game. Okay. It is, well spotted. Yeah, Wayne Rooney on the cover, <laughs> giving it away. But oh. I think it's... Um, it's it's done better than you know everything else this year so far. Yeah, yeah. Is, we knew it was going to be big. Better than Halo Reach, and um, yeah, I thought it was curious that uh, the second and third place now for biggest launch ever in the UK, uh, Modern Warfare 2, GTA 4, like not not a FIFA game. Mm -hmm. So obviously FIFA huge this year. What's what's so special this this time around? Uh, so good review scores. I mean, obviously it's um, it's done really well over the last few years. It's kind of picked up mm. from it was getting beaten by Pro Evo critically, and now it's the top, the absolute top of the game. Um, pardon the pun. And also, the, the supermarkets in the UK tend to do the promotions around this game. Yeah, I saw some of so they, so they, yeah, they knock it down by quite a lot. And then there was one supermarket that was offering, if you trade in a recent game like uh, Dead Rising, you get it for 99p, which is a bit of a no-brainer for a lot of people who are upgrading. Um, so it's done really well. It's not Formula One 2010 off the top of the uh, charts, now down, now down to number two. Um, and, but it's remained ahead of both Dead Rising 2, even though that's risen, and Halo Reach, which is falling down um, yeah, rapidly. pretty dramatically over the, the, the next couple of weeks. So, um, yes, yes, well done FIFA. Yeah. You've done all right. I'm sure they'll release another one next year. Uh, yeah, I reckon. Uh, next news story is uh, more to do with you, Jane, yeah. more along your interest lines. Mine. Um, Cataclysm. Yeah, so uh, Blizzard's finally dated uh, Cataclysm. Uh, last week, rumours were flying that Cataclysm, the latest expansion for World of Warcraft, that is, wasn't going to be released until early next year. But Blizzard's now settled the matter by confirming a December 7th uh, release date for the add-on to its all-conquering MMORPG. Uh, it will raise the game's level cap from 80 uh, to 85, and the game's world's been reworked, and there's new areas, and there's a new race for each of the factions, and the Horde get Goblins, and the Alliance get Organ. Cataclysm is the big one now, because because it, yes. it obviously raised the level cap, which is always a big deal, but it's going to actually revamp the world, better graphics. Yeah, it's for the first time um, the, the the overhaul that the, the expansion brings takes place in the original game world rather than adding a big new area on, although there are new areas as well. And so it's kind of a big deal. So it's a cataclysmic event. Completely, you might say. You might say. So it's actually going to be coming out this year. Yes. Probably the last big release of the year. Yeah, biggest is it December gonna, release. Is it going to some. ruin slash make Christmas? My Christmas. For you? Um, I might. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out in November that I'm going to want to play, so I might still be on those and quite heavily involved with those until I don't know early in the following year. So, but it's not. It's not a race. It's not a race. <laughs> it's not a race. So, uh, so it's launching December the seventh. Are mm -hmm. you going to be there in the queue? Uh, I'll be lining working. Up. Probably. Be working? Yeah. But so, I'll be there one way or the other. So you're going to be there. Yeah. What's the class that you're going to be? I know you played the beta. Yeah. You, you were you were trying to get hold of Mr. Bitey. Yeah, taken. The wolf. It was taken. When he come? Yeah, no Mr. There. Bitey for me. I got um, Nick 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 Furry. Nick Furry. Yeah. Very good. But uh, yeah, so the beta was running since June. Um, I'm. It's not a new class thing actually. There are no new classes. It's it's new races. So yeah, Wargan is is definitely my new race of choice. Mm -hmm. So starting from scratch with uh, with Nick Furry or Nick whoever Furry. I can get. Is he, so he's yours now. He well, he is. I, I don't actually. I don't know if it's going to carry over from the beta, so I might get back in there, with Mr. Bitey, possibly. Mm. And you can find out more about the game. You did a. You did a huge video about this, flying around. You did a moderately sized video <laughs> about <laughs> the new. Well, it's it's the it's the old world, but kind of changed, and you can uh, now fly in it. You you didn't used to be able to take um, your flying mounts into into those areas, so it's mm. quite cool to see things from from above. Mm -hmm. And how many how many sort of characters are you running at the moment? Um, I've got a main, and I've got a handful of alts, but I. I I don't really have time for alts, so maybe just one one more character. Who has time? Who has time for alts, right? Uh, so our next news story is Medal of Honor multiplayer de-Talibanizing. 
Uh, following complaints from families who have lost loved ones during the conflict in Afghanistan, um, EA has now confirmed that Medal of Honor will no longer let players assume the role of the Taliban in the game's multiplayer mode. Uh, instead, they're going to be named the opposing forces. But they'll so, be the same in, in every other respect, same so character models. Yeah, it's same the same. Maps. Everything, the game is exactly the same. Yeah. But I, in the I, menu, it's... In the multiplayer menus, um, as I understand it, it'll say opposing force uh, rather than any references to Taliban specifically. Right. So it's kind of a token gesture and maybe uh, EA trying to nip this in the bud before the game actually comes out and people who haven't already heard about the Taliban issue hear about it and, and uh, kick off. Because there's been a lot of fuss over it. Like in the UK, Liam Fox, the Defence Secretary, has, has called it out as, as in poor taste. In America, they've taken the game, well, it's not out yet, but they're, they won't sell it on army bases in yeah, the US. Yeah, that's right. So, but EA seemed to hold its nerve right up until the end, like well, the game's out in a few weeks. Yeah. They've announced this now. Yeah. Uh, Greg uh, Goodrick, who's the um, executive producer, announced this on the official website. Mm -hmm. You've played more of the game. Mm. Right? Do you think it was a big deal to begin with? Um, I, it's a, that's a tough question. I think it's a it's a gesture of compromise that yeah. might do them well when the game comes out, but they really haven't changed a great deal. So maybe some people will see through that, and uh, and maybe the gamers will see that they haven't really lost anything. Mm. Um, it makes me think of um, like Counter Strike, a little you know terrorist win kind of thing. It's just a generic generic opposing force, but it's pretty clear who they are, and you are in Afghanistan. So I don't know if taking the name Taliban out of it really changes much. Sure. Yeah. So the single player um, is completely unchanged. You're still playing yeah. as the US, um, uh, was it called the, uh, it's called Tier 1, right? Tier, Tier 1, one and Rangers, and US Rangers as well. Um, and so what was interesting to me from reading your recent coverage is that um, the single player game is using a completely different engine to the multiplayer. I knew yeah. that the single player was being developed in Los Angeles yeah. um, and the multiplayer is being developed by DICE in Sweden. Yeah. But they're yeah. using completely different engines. Yeah, so DICE has got their Frostbite engine, a modified version of their Frostbite engine, so uh, maybe feels a little bit more like Battlefield Bad Company too, right. but not, not actually as close as you might think. And um, yeah, Danger Place in LA using Unreal. So I, in the interview, uh, Greg Goodrich, the executive producer, was saying that it's going to feel is going to feel different. They didn't try too hard to make it seem like it's built on one engine. Mm. They sort of embraced the, the differences, so to speak. Okay. And they're, they're, you can check out um, interviews with those guys. Their beard's coming along yes. nicely. Yeah, Greg's, Greg's winning. in particular. He's winning everything. So, so they're, they're growing yeah. beards to is it raise money for a charity. Yeah, yeah he's going to double what, double whatever they raise with sponsorship for their beards. Nice, yes. nice. So you can check out Jane's preview coverage, interviews, as well as news, all of the news we've just covered, as well as many more stories. Just head over to gamespot.com slash news. Okay, time now for a look at Deus Ex Human Revolution. We spoke to the game's writer, James Swallow, and art director, Jonathan Jack Bell Tate, about what we'll get in the next instalment of the Lauded Action RPG series. Breaking news. The riots continue in the streets of Detroit. Protesters rallying outside of Seraph Industries, one of the world's leaders in the controversial science of human augmentation. So, uh, I'm Jonathan Jack Bell Tate, and I'm the art director on uh, Deus Ex uh, Human Revolution. It's a cyberpunk universe, right? You can't, you can't get a, um, you know, away from it. Um, so, the first thing that, that I made sure is that kind of, kind of define what the main uh, visual archetypes of, of cyberpunk are, and that uh, those archetypes uh, uh, would be, you know, in the game. So, one of the main things, for example, was like all the fog and all the smoke and that kind of stuff, right? Kind of like the really hazy lighting and all that kind of stuff that, that, that. Um, that, uh, that, that you would see like in Blade Runner or something like Ghost in the Shell and, that, and those kind of movies, right? Um, then in terms of like the overall look, we wanted to have something that was, uh, you know, kind of fairly stylized, not going for photorealism. So again, a lot of the, like, you know, Japanese game aesthetics in a sense, if you look at what, uh, you know, Square Enix does, or, or and, and I'm really not saying this because uh, they own us, is really stuff that we like straight from, from the get-go. So like Konami, Capcom, that kind of thing. And um, so a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we can see the influence from from Square Enix right now that because they're under the umbrella of Square Enix and all those things were there way before uh, Square Enix bought us right we were just that much more stoked when they bought us because there was some kind of a uh, uh, kind of like we're all on the same page aesthetically speaking because we already liked um, kind of like the same the same kind of uh, approaches if you want. It almost took a year, really, to um, to do the uh, the trailer with them. Um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't easy at first. We needed to kind of like uh, you know get on the same page in terms of uh, it was it was the first time that Square also were, were uh, dealing with uh, with uh, you know external people and uh, and not doing something that's like their game or like a Final Fantasy or whatnot. So, uh, but I mean, once those things were um, 
were kind of cleared out of the way. It was, a, it was just really amazing because, again, the kind of aesthetic that, that me and my team wanted was something that was really natural for, for, for Square Enix. So, um, you know, our designs were all done already. Uh, we just kind of like shipped all of our designs, even some of our models, and they just kind of up them and everything. And uh, um, it went super smoothly. I mean, it's just, uh, what else can you ask, right, than having Square Enix really doing your, doing like such a big trailer uh, uh, for you. How do you feel, Adam? The body may heal, but the mind is not always so resilient. I got a phone call in uh, 2007 from a friend of mine who told me that uh, the company was looking for a writer to come on board and it was a science fiction action adventure cyberpunk game which is all kind of right up my alley so I said yeah absolutely sounds great and then I got a call from our narrative designer um, Mary DeMarle and she told me it was Deus Ex and I was practically offering to pay money to work on the project then and there. There's a huge amount of script writing that we've had to do, uh, you know, not just from uh, regular kind of cutscene style sort of storytelling, but there's also the, the unique conversation gameplay mechanic that we have in the game, which enables you to, to literally play out a conversation with, with another character, uh, you know, in order to progress through the level. And, and designing those was, was uh, it's unlike anything else I've ever worked on in, in script writing, game writing, or, or prose writing. It was having to create multiple plans of attack, multiple lines of storytelling and narrative, all of which have to work and have to seem correct and contiguous and real. It was a, it was a fantastic challenge, um, but you know, one that was just really great to take on board. The, the novel I'm working on is called um, Deus Ex Icarus Effect, and it's kind of, a, I guess you would describe it as almost a parallel story that, that, that runs uh, alongside uh, the plot of the, the opening sections of the plot of the game. So there's, uh, there's some crossover between characters. Some of the characters that you'll see in the game appear in the novel. Uh, there are some new characters that just appear in the novel. And there are also some connections to, shall we say, classic Deus Ex story elements in there. So it's kind of bringing all of those things together and, and showing you a, a different aspect of the story. You know, you can play the game and you get one kind of story there and you know, you can read the novel and you get kind of a different sort of story, but all based in the same universe, the same reality, I guess you would call it. I mean, it's a, it's a game about secrets, it's a game about chaos and conspiracy, it's a game about um, massive world-changing events and there's a lot of deep, hidden, scary, cool stuff in there that of course we can't talk about. What has been revealed is just a drop into a, a, a really the, the entire content and the story and all that kind of stuff that, uh, and the gameplay that the game has to offer. So, um, I mean, it'll most probably be you know, some other stuff that we'll release before, uh, before the game is actually released. But uh, be that or not, yeah, there's got, it's, it's always gonna be really just a tiny, tiny little, little part of what the final product will be. It's a huge game. You know, if I, if I look at the result now, if I think back at what I had in mind at the beginning, it's, it's pretty much exactly uh, what it was. You know, if you look at the bullet point that, uh, that we had, it's, um, it's, it's right up there. So yeah, I'm really happy about it. But it was hard, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my name is uh, Jonathan Jacques Villatet. I'm the art director on DSX Human Revolution, and the game will be out uh, sometime in the early uh, 2011, so watch out for it. Costume Quest is Double Fine's Halloween flavored RPG, available to download later this month. We had a word with the project lead Tasha Harris and Double Fine Productions head and all-round legend Tim Schafer about the game. Hi, I'm Tasha Harris and I'm the project lead on Costume Quest. Costume Quest is a Halloween themed RPG in which you play as one of a pair of twins, a brother and sister. And uh, you go trick-or-treating and uh, collect costumes. And uh, as you're trick-or-treating, uh, your either brother or sister, whichever one you don't pick, um, gets kidnapped. So the whole objective of the game is to rescue your brother or sister. The original game actually came about from when I was a kid. Like I always loved Halloween and I always loved uh, video games. And I always loved drawing. So I remember just drawing these little trick-or-treating kids like when I was a kid and like it just kind of has been kicking around in my head ever since. 
This is our first time doing a game with THQ. We're doing two games with them, and they've been uh, great so far. They responded um, to, I think, the look of the game and the idea. It's kind of original concept, and um, right away they uh, they like the concept of both games and have um, kind of supported the idea behind the games really well. Well, we had this AAA engine from Brutal Legend that we put a lot of money into. It had a lot of features. It was a very broad game in terms of what it had driving and flying and all these different things. So it was a great engine that allowed us to um, make games that are smaller but still have a AAA look to them, you know? So they're not like, um, we didn't want to do casual games that look cheap or look like they were just ported from a, a web game or something like that. We wanted to do games that use the, um, the capabilities of this uh, massive engine but scaled down to be a, a dense, um, intense experience. Someone new has come to town. Now the monsters are all real, and we have to take them down. Yeah. Um, at Double Fun right now, we're doing a new sort of plan of doing um, four smaller games instead of one big game. So instead of doing one game every four years, like we've done so far, uh, we're doing four games uh, a year uh, currently at the current rate. Uh, and that's been a lot of fun. We did it as a, just as a test. Uh, we took a two week period and we took the whole company and we split it into four parts and then each team of roughly like 10 to 15 people, we had two weeks to make a game. Just make a game in two weeks. And that's where Costume Quest came from. It was a little demo of uh, the characters walking around the world and um, we saw the, the, the fun of that. And so um, as a company, we just had a lot of fun making those smaller games in, 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 in four groups. And so now we're doing that for real. Well, growing up, I always loved RPGs. So that's kind of probably my main inspiration is games like Earthbound or Dragon Quest or the early Final Fantasies. Um, yeah, I guess my main objective was I wanted to make something that felt kind of like those old games in a nostalgic kind of way, but updated. So like the graphics are nicer, like, you know, the gameplay mechanics are a bit more polished. So um, it's kind of like taking the old style of game, but applying applying what we know as game developers now to, to the old style of game. Uh, there's not a lot of RPGs out there that are, that are funny. <laughs> there's not a lot of games out there that are funny, but um, you know, and I think, uh, just the, the Halloween theme is kind of pervasive throughout the whole game, and I think that really gives it a sense of charm and, and style that's unique. Um, somewhat similar to the Psychonauts uh, fan of like uh, both younger players and older players. Like younger players get very excited about dressing up in costumes and the fantasy element of it, and um, older players sometimes are more nostalgic for that time in their life when they were you know running around in in costume and, and maybe trick or treating on Halloween. Um, Costume Quest is just a lot of fun for me to play even myself because I didn't work directly on it except for writing a bunch of dialogue for it. And so um, I've been playing it and experiencing the combat and the, and the quests in it. And um, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's fun in the way that a lot of the old school RPGs like um, Earthbound and games like that are fun. Um, in that they're just, they're, uh, it's kind of charming and not necessarily a, a big fantasy epic. Um, saving the entire world from some crazy, you know, and there's definitely some, you're saving a lot of candy and you're saving your brother and sister, but um, uh, it's the candy. I guess I would essentially say it's about the candy. I'm Tim Schaefer, the founder and president of Double Fine Productions in San Francisco, the makers of Costume Quest. Costume Quest is coming out uh, this fall for PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade. Since the last Start Select, when we unveiled our competition to win an epic gaming PC built by our own fair hands, Mark and I have started plugging components into that giant motherboard. Earlier this week, we gave the heart of the rig, half of the RAM, and one of the processors a test boot, like so. Today, GameSpot, we're back with another edition of Greatest Gaming Rig, the show where we build an ultra-powerful PC and give you the chance to win it. This week, we've taken a handful of precious components and slotted them onto our beast of a motherboard, ready to boot it up, hopefully getting the rig to post to the BIOS. But before we turn this mofo on, let's take a look at what's on the board. 
First up, we've got a single Xeon processor onto which we've placed Corsair's H70 liquid cooler right here. There it is. It's this rather evil looking thing right here. So this is really cool actually because as you can see, there's, it's only like a little small circular thing here, a very small low profile um, section, but it actually contains the liquid and the pump. So what happens is the liquid comes from the radiator, gets pumped through, round and back into the radiator. So it takes the heat out and then the push-pull fan configuration blows it out again. Keeps you in it nice and cool, but all in one little compact unit, which I think is very, very cool. That is neat. Yes. Uh, next, we slotted in some RAM. We've only been able to use 12 gigs so far, uh, as we'd need both processors loaded to use the full 24 gig. Yeah, that's right. So right you can see our 12 gigs of RAM here. Now we can't use the full 24, because like you said, we've only got one processor in, and the way this motherboard works is, the RAM is linked to each processor. So even if we plug 12 in now, it just wouldn't detect it and work until we've got the other one in there. Mm -hmm. Right, and GameSpot user The Jamin is back with more tech insight on the RAMs. He says, and I quote, Psy, RAM timings must be low if they're using 1600. Uh, and quoting us, he says, they might be overkill for gaming, but they should ensure our rig will be able to handle everything we throw at it. He says, let's spend that money instead of working out the math to ensure we clear that CPU bottleneck face palm. He palmed his face. He did that. palm his face. Well, so. there was no need for such face palming because the board itself actually only supports 1600 megahertz RAM. So even if we wanted to stick faster RAM in there, we, we can't. Um, this RAM, however, if you look at the actual RAM timings, is pretty good. It's rated 88824. Um, as has been proven a million times, though, that's generally quite meaningless. You know, it's, I mean, unless they're very, very low figures, but that's pretty good. And the fact is, we'll be able to overclock this RAM and make it go faster anyway, so it's all good. Indeed. We also have Corsair's 120 gig force SSD hooked up to a SATA 3 port for maximum speed, and we've also chucked in a single GTX 460 from Zotac, just, uh, just the one for there now. There you go, yes, just the one. Uh, the reason for that is we want to keep the configuration as simple as possible. Um, that's so that if anything does go wrong, um, we'll be able to figure it, yeah, and it inevitably will. We'll, <laughs> we'll be able to figure out why it's gone wrong pretty quickly because there's so few components. So we'll be able to say unplug the graphics card and figure out if that's what the, the BIOS isn't detecting properly or if it's like the hard drive, even the optical drive, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we've hooked up the whole lot to our AX1200 power supply. Now, this thing is a beast. It's Corsair's top of the range modular PSU which is very, very cool. Right. So as you can see here, this is it. It's, it's, I mean, it's massive for a start. And you can see it's modular, so we've only got a few cables plugged in at the moment, but you'd be able to plug in as many as you want or as few as you want, which is great. It keeps the case nice and tidy when you're building it. So. Okay, and it came with a... Yes. Fabulous velour slipcase. It case. did. It came with a really, really comprehensive package. Including the velour yes. slipcase. A velour slipcase, which, um, which is cool, and it's nice that it came shipped in there. When you'd ever use this again, I don't know, because you put it in the computer and you're very unlikely to take that out on Keep a regular it warm basis. Or something. I yeah, don't know. I don't know. Maybe you could store like socks in it or something. I'm not sure. Anyway, but there you go. Yeah, and then you've got this case with a yes. whole. A whole bunch of cables. A whole heap of cables, so just tons of these things. Um, yeah, the modular cables, which you can Indeed. plug in. And they're all wrapped as well, which is very cool. Okay, that's cool. Sort of stuff. Finally, we borrowed this optical drive from our chums at ZDNet, just so we can get an OS on this thing later. We're going to yeah. need one of those. Yeah, we yeah. are going to need one at some point. Um, all right, so now let's try and power this bad boy on. Let's see if we can get this thing going. Anyway. All, right. all right, so... Onboard uh, power switch on the motherboard. Very useful for situations like this. Ah. Okay, so we're lit up. It's alive. So what we're waiting for now uh, is something to appear on this monitor, which means we get a post screen, which means it's going to load up into the BIOS, and hopefully it all works. So let's see how it goes. Yes. Looks about right. Looking good, looking good. Let's see if I push delete to get into the BIOS. Hopefully it will see everything. You can see our hard drive. Yes. There yes. We okay. There we go. So as you can see, we've got into the BIOS, which is cool, which means everything works. Um, it all works together, which is an achievement, <laughs> frankly, um, from you know all these different manufacturers and everything works great. Um, so if we go into standard BIOS features, you can see here um, our processor, so our X5680 running at 3.3 three gigahertz 
And below that, you can see our system memory, um, which there says uh, 12 gigabytes. So that's very cool. So you can see that all running. Um, one of the cool things about this BIOS is, is meant you can basically tune everything on the computer, like literally everything. So one of the things it's got is frequency and voltage control. Um, so you can control like all the voltage supplied to the RAM, the processor, etc. So you can overclock it which is very cool. So we'll be fiddling with that um, at some point um, when we're overclocking the machine and hopefully it won't, it won't explode or catch fire or anything like that. Uh -uh. It should be good. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. So don't forget, you have the chance to win this entire rig complete with its mind-bending processing power and awesome accessory bundle. All you have to do to win this amazing prize is tell us how much you think the rig would cost in total if you got all the parts at standard price. And as a tiebreaker, tell us in 50 words or less why you think you deserve it. You can enter the competition over on the site and read more about the build over on the hardware blog. Just head over to tinyurl.com slash gsukpcComp to find out more. To enter, you have to be over 13 and a UK resident, and the competition is subject to our normal terms and conditions. Sadly, it is a UK-only competition, but as user Mardin puts it, Payback Americans, I'm so happy right now, on live equals US only, Vindictus equals US only, now this is UK only. Finally, some justice in the world. One back for the UK. Apparently, yep. Take that, Americans. All right, we'll be back again next week where Jane and I will finish putting this bad boy together, get an OS installed, and prep it for some hardcore benchmarks. Remember to head over to tinyurl.com slash gsukpcomp to enter the competition and to follow the blog. And log on to facebook.com slash gamespotuk to take a peek behind the scenes of the build. Till next time, happy gaming, spotters. Time for this week's new releases now. These are the big games arriving in stores this week. First up. Enslaved Odyssey to the West on Xbox 360 and PS3. So Ninja Theory's luscious looking action game puts a sci-fi spin on the 16th century classic Chinese novel Journey to the West, which you might know better as the 1980s TV series Monkey. Our reviewer gave it an 8.0 and the art design alone makes it worth a look. Who knew the post-apocalypse didn't have to be grey and brown? Castlevania Lords of Shadow is next up on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. The Castlevania series gets rebooted in Lords of Shadow, set in medieval Europe and starring Gabriel Belmont, a knight with a combat cross whip and a quest to bring his murdered wife back from beyond. We gave the game a 7.5, with the highlights being its good looks and great combat. And then we've got Wii Party on the Wii, no doubt. Uh, no prizes for guessing what this one does. It's a collection of games that might do well at a party, with multiplayer mini-games along the lines of Hide and Seek, Bingo, Wheel of Fortune and such. And it's good. We gave it an 8.0. It's also Nintendo's first first-party party game since 2007's Mario Party 8. Party. Pro Evolution Soccer 2011 on pretty much every format going. Uh, PES 2011 returns with a completely new gameplay engine, online Master League and the Copa Libertadores for the first time ever. And if you prefer basketball to football, there's NBA 2K11. And if you prefer handheld fantasy RPGs by Square Enix to sports, there's Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light for the DS. Mecha action game Front Mission Evolved also gets a European release this week on the PC, Xbox 360 and PS3. All right, we have gathered up the best comments and feedback from the Start Select page from the last show. Remember, we love reading what you have to say. Just head over to gamespot.com slash start select and voice your brain thoughts. So Noah Flabbiness said, uh, by the time they the finish building the computer, there will be newer technology. Ha 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 ha. Uh, so we yeah. assume he's referring to the greatest gaming rig. Uh, yeah, I or assume so. Or it could so. just be a supercomputer that someone else is he building. We're making. Yeah. Elsewhere. <laughs> Um, so it's true, I mean, there is always newer technology, but uh, it's going to be cutting edge at the time of making, um, as, as, as it's now. It's not bad And as it's well. still going to be pretty good come next year. You'll be able to play, you know, probably Bejeweled and PopCap games on it. So. I reckon. I think 24 gig will do that, of, of RAM. Yeah. Yeah. Several times over. All right. Okay. Sad PSP Addict says, lots of effort for such a minority interest in a gaming PC. Great show otherwise. So some How can you say that? There. PC gaming is still huge. It is. I, I think he means like building a gaming PC. Uh, I I don't know how many people, well, perhaps we can say that it is relatively niche to, to build your own. But uh, that's why we're building it for you. Well, if it's a lost art, you and Mark we're are reviving bringing it, it back. We're a lost art, yes. Uh, Cloud Warrior 79 says, this makes me sound really, really sad, but all that PC talk turned me on. It's going to be pretty epic, correct? Mm. Cloud Warrior 79. And I'd see what some Concur. Would maybe. <laughs> uh, John Katzis says, uh, was that dude from Dead Rising smacking zombies with a sex toy? Question mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> Yes, yes he was, and thanks for your question. Excellent. Uh, remember, you can get in touch with the show, just uh, hit up our Start Select page and let us know what you think. 
Last time on the show, we gave you lucky people the chance to win a collection of Dead Rising 2 swag, including the all-important game on PlayStation 3. All you had to do was tell us the name of the main character in Dead Rising 2. The answer was Chuck Green, and our winner is Gary Ziddens from Yately, who can now make notes in his official Dead Rising 2 notebook while wearing his official Dead Rising 2 t-shirt, while vaccinating himself with the official Dead Rising 2 Zombrex. It's good to be prepared for the impending zombie apocalypse. Uh, this week, courtesy of Konami, we have three copies of Castlevania Laws of Shadows to give away. The game launches in the UK on Friday the 8th of October, but all you need to do to win a copy is name one of the voice actors in the game. If you think you can do that, jot it in an email and send it to competitions at gamesport.co.uk with your name and address before 19th of October and we will draw the winners on the next episode of the show. All right, that does it from us, but we'll be bringing you another Start Select on 22nd of October. Remember to follow GameSpot UK's Twitter feed over at twitter.com slash GameSpot UK and let us know what you think about the show by heading over to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash GameSpot UK. We'll see you next time.